Thank you very much. First, thanks to organizers, everyone, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to bring people from all these different areas together and interact. So I'll tell you a little bit, or I'll give you a little bit of an overview over gravitational wave memory that has become quite an active field recently. And I'd like to um, start, just say one or two maybe different ways of approaching this, um, this theme. So by, we always solve the Einstein equations or we partially solve the Einstein equations when we try to do, uh, solve problems in general relativity. And of course, we are interested in space times where we have gravitational radiation. And um, two typical scenarios are often, of course, if you have some isolated systems or close by binary black hole mergers. So I can um, deal with that as an isolated system and look at asymptotically flat space times. But if the source is very far away, then we are in a cosmological setting and then we have to deal with the cosmological um, Einstein equations. So first, let me start with some um, pictures. So this is Einstein. He used to play violin a lot together with a mathematician Horwitz and Horwitz's daughter. And I thought, yeah, I'll just bring in a little bit of um, a different aspect of Einstein also. So here are Einstein's equations. And we all know and cherish them, of course. So we have on the left-hand side the geometric quantities, curvature, and the metric. And on the right-hand side, so we plug in whatever fields we are dealing with, like electromagnetic fields, fluids, etc., and also give the equations for this system. And so when we go, and just to, what I mentioned before, so either we have close-by sources that we treat as asymptotically flat, then we are in the situation where we don't have a lambda constant in here, so this would be the cosmological extension of Einstein equations. And the nice situation about the asymptotically flat setting is that, well, if I have a system that radiates two black holes or binary neutron stars that collide, so radiation travels at the speed of light along so-called null hypersurfaces. I think of them as just generalized light cones in a general space time. And then we are sitting at this null infinity and observing backwards in kind of looking backwards in this space, in this null cones to see where radiation comes from. And so we can read off um, from this null infinity our information about radiation. When we go to a cosmological space time, this, this so-called null infinity becomes space-like. So we do not have this nice tool to read off information about radiation. So how do we handle that part? So that's going to be one answer to that question also. Um, first of all, before I even talk about memory, etc., there's also um, just maybe an approach to mathematical problems. So we have audience, astrophysicists, physicists, philosophers, mathematicians, etc. So we all talk or want to solve the same problems, but we have different approaches. And so one thing as a mathematician, so if I want, I'm interested in, let's say, problems from physics, but how do I solve that? So the mathematical machinery will be, I will try to get initial data mathematically that describe as, po as well as possible some uh, phenomena in nature, and then I solve the Einstein equations, which means I reconstruct the space times. And we can do that either very geometric analytically or with numerical uh, relativity that we heard about today as well. And, or we can sometimes not solve the full problem uh, the way we would like to, but then we go and use approximation methods. So there's one caution in, in this whole business here at some point that I would like to point out. So um, often mathematicians uh, like myself think, oh, this is a wonderful equation, a beautiful result. Might be in the mathematical world, but I'm interested also to make the bridge and see is there physics in it. And there's sometimes there might be the problem that I have a solution of Einstein's equation, which formally I can write down, but what is the physical content? So if I'm interested, for instance, in certain asymptotics of a very special system, so I may, it may not look like as uh, I, I could, I guess, at first um, sight. I have to dig deeper into the geometry and actually analyze really um, if the asymptotics are what they um, should be. So maybe one more thing before we go to the gravitational radiation. So at the beginning of TR, so there were many physicists and mathematicians, of course, interested and worked on the problem. The two mathematicians I'd like to point out is Hermann Weil and Yvonne choquet -Bruyard. So um, they, there were many pioneers that really tried to solve or 
um, set up the initial value problem for the Einstein equations. When we look at these equations, they look so nice and compact, but to set up this as a really PDE um, partial differential equation system was a very hard task and it took until 1952 when this lady, Yvonne Choquebria, actually solved it. This was the starting point to do the mathematics in that sense. Okay, so um, maybe just it, it was talked about already today, of course, so when I say null infinity, what I mean is, well, I'm sitting on a null hypersurface, a light cone, and I go out to null infinity, so there some curvature um, components, some physical quantities will have limits there and I can read off something about the radiation field. And the black hole region, so we have heard that also several times today, so from a black hole nothing can go out to null infinity, so I can define it uh, in that way, for instance. So gravitational waves, of course, um, detected by the wonderful um, if, uh, success by LIGO and now Virgo joined the project. So we think of a source as going on some time-like path and sending out radiation that goes along these null hypersurfaces. So how can we now, um, op well, what can we now say about um, the memory? So what is the memory effect first? So gravitational waves you have seen is changing the curvature of the space time, it's changing the space time itself. Um, it's a wave in the space time. And what is the memory? The memory is, um, also predicted by the Einstein equations, and this is what we call a permanent change of the space-time. So we um, think of, for instance, if these are three test masses, like they are uh, um, also used in LIGO, for instance, and let's say, let's assume the wave comes from this direction to be <coughs> simple in the talk. So then, of course, what has been seen already are these instantaneous displacements, so this, um, well, that LIGO has shown us, these this, um, curves. But what happens when the wave packet now travels through and we are back at rest again? So GR predicts that there will be a permanent change of the space-time itself. And because these test masses are floating on geodesics in space-time, as we can think of that, they are following the geodesic motion. So one should be able to see that in the future as a permanent change. Maybe a little bit about the history of how this um, memory was this, um, found the first time. So Lovich and Polnareff in 1974 worked in the linearized theory and found for the first time, oh, there's a change which is permanent that um, will occur. This was um, believed to be a very small event, actually. Then Christodoulou in 91, so he studied the full nonlinear problem and found, oh, there's a bigger event or there's something even bigger uh, which, is, which is this memory and this should be observed in principle. So for a while people thought of this as a linear and nonlinear um, issue of the same event but this is actually not the case. It has nothing to do with the linearity or nonlinearity of the problem. So Garfinkel and I for instance showed that um, so this what we call nowadays an ordinary memory has to do with changing uh, of a component of the curvature over time and this null memory has to do with fields that actually do get out to null infinity. And having, so there are many people, by the way, who actually worked early on on memory that um, includes um, Braginsky, Thorne, Damour, these people. So there was a, uh, some literature um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s about that mainly. So there's been a lot of activities. So um, we have been able to show that, well, if you plug in an uh, so the uh, an energy momentum tensor. So what you would suggest just by a back of the envelope calculation is, oh, there might be a contribution. But it might not, depending on how this coupled system uh, evolves. So it, your energy momentum part may not actually reach null infinity. But we showed that for electromagnetic fields and neutrino radiation, you will get a contribution that enlarges this memory effect. So um, outside GR, we found in the Maxwell equations, which are linear, of course, two types of this memory. And recently, I mean, Andy Strominger had this beautiful idea of relating the memory effect, right, to soft theorems and asymptotic uh, symmetry. So this um, sparked a lot of uh, new research, and I'm apologizing to people. I, I would have to add maybe five or ten or more slides to add people's names. So there's been a lot of work in these areas lately. And um, so in this talk, I will mainly focus on the GR part and show you a very simple example of the electromagnetic case without GR, just to see um, maybe the ideas uh, behind it. So this ordinary memory and the null memory, 
um, are really charged by the following. So the ordinary memory, again, this is something, this is one component of the curvature that changes over time. And the null memory, if I write it down, so this is energy radiated to infinity um, here. And so this first part, this is what we usually call the news tensor. So this is a purely geometric part, the shear that gets um, 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 into this formula. And the second part, this is any type of energy momentum tensor that behaves the right way. So if you have an energy momentum tensor um, coupled to Einstein equations um, that behaves the right way, this will actually also contribute to that. Interesting, maybe I would like to point out this last Ethrain, Levin, Blackman, Chen paper. So they suggested that with stacking events, one should actually be able to observe the memory with LIGO at some point. So maybe back to um, the, the, the basics. So when I, when I want to measure geodesic motion, right, or what we do measuring um, when we see gravitational waves, so we can measure here, um, I have a, an acceleration basic on the left-hand side and have the curvature on the right-hand side. And how we get information about this curvature, that can be really by studying and investigating the space times and or approximating um, solutions, numerical studies, etc. But we need to know something about the right, right hand side. So, again, so this will be a permanent displacement that should occur in any such um, detector. Now, to make things a little bit more simple, so this is all in the asymptotically flat case. So, there's two more pieces I would like to add to make, give you a very simple case and look at. Um, at this a little bit more closely and, and focus into the ordinary and null part of the memory, I'll give you an example from pure electromagnetism, just Maxwell equations, and I'll add more about the cosmological space-time, how the memory looks like in a cosmological space-time. So um, if I would like to think of a, in the Maxwell case, so we also were able to find something we call a null memory and something we call an ordinary memory, so what would that be? So in that sense, I mean, if I think of the gravitational waves, for instance, so the gravitational waves follow the particle and show then a permanent displacement, that would be the memory effect. So um, simpler in the Maxwell case, it, it would be the following, you would have charged test masses and you would um, expect that these test masses have a residual kick in a direction you would not expect it to be. So a residual velocity, we, we call that a kick. So in the gravitational sense, a displacement in the electromagnetic one, it would be a kick. And let me maybe give you a very simple example of what we mean by that. This also should shed light on these two types of memory in the GR case. So if I have just a motion of charge in the presence of an electromagnetic wave, so that's very simple computation, we all know that, I can write it down as this equation. So if I have now, let's say I want an electromagnetic wave to pass my test masses, so I want to measure some residual velocity, which will be given by, well, of course, an integral over the electric field. Now I can take just, I mean, Jackson, for instance, and if I don't know the formula by, by in my head, and um, write down some uh, simple facts. So if I do a slow motion approximation, I can write down for E, so I take here the dipole moment, right, derivatives of the dipole moment, I project this orthogonal to the radial direction. And so if I say, well, if I have charges which move far away at constant velocity, so I'll have to make sure that this is um, um, guaranteed. So if I take this all into account, I can compute the very simple formula that, well, if I just plug that in, and I let t go to minus and plus infinity, I'll get a residual velocity which is given by this expression here, which is really the difference of the sums of these charges. That's a very simple thing which would um, account for this ordinary memory. But what would this null memory be? So what would the analogon of that be? So here we still look at the same equation. I want to compute some delta v. And but I want to, do, to go back to the Maxwell equations and look at them a little bit more closely. So let's maybe um, uh, just decompose them. I, I use coordinates on a sphere and on a radial direction. So the capital letters A, B are on the sphere. R is the radial direction. And we all know Maxwell's equations. So let me just go one step further and say, well, if I do, I uh, introduce now my retarded time here. And if I 
just expand um, my field in, in these coordinates. So I have this part that I will look at. And then I have, of course, here the current <coughs> J showing up, which will be interesting. So thank you. What can we do? So if I look at the current, I can actually write this down. This has some portions that go um, out to null infinity um, in that sense for the, for the type of uh, fields that I would like to express here. So if I think in the classical case of a charge which is massless and goes at the speed of light. Okay, in classical mechanics, I, uh, classical theory, I can do that. So this would give me a value here for J that goes like R to the minus two, which would go out to null infinity. So and exactly this will come in, will, will create my null memory. So I can um, now integrate here, the, that was the leading order part of the electric field on the sphere. I get a, um, a quantity here, S, and I actually get in the end, a velocity formula, I get um, uh, energy radiated to infinity, which will come from these massless charged particles. And when I compute everything together, I'll get a velocity here, which is due to this energy radiated away. So there's an energy radiated away by um, um, the charge radiated out to null infinity. Now you can ask, well, these things don't really occur in nature, these uh, massless charged particles, but it turns out there's something interesting that will happen. So if I have a particle, let's say like an electron, of course, which has mass, but I can now accelerate that at very high speed, at very high velocity. So um, in that case, we can show that this ordinary memory will actually mimic the null memory. So this particle will show something like a null memory also that should in principle be um, measurable. So there will be a kick which, um, if I have still a time-like particle, just going at very high speed. So this will take over basically this, um, mimic this null memory of a null particle at some sense. And uh, this should be measurable in principle. And the same way I actually can think of the memory in the, in, in, in GR in some sense. So what is the ordinary and what is the null memory? So this was just a very simple example from Maxwell equations. In my last few minutes, I'd like to tell you just a very brief um, result or story about the cosmological setting. And going back to the beginning, I said, well, in asymptotically flat space times, you have this beautiful null, um, null infinity, but now we don't have that. So in cosmological space times, we're in trouble. But Good for us, we live in a space-time domain where, um, well, the scaling is for, in our favor. So if I want to go and um, maybe jump over here. So um, the scaling is to our favor, sorry, in the sense that, um, well, I can look at the zone in the cosmological space-time, which is not so far away from Minkowski, which is close to the source. And then we can prove, we can show that still, um, let's say the gravitational waves and the memory effect are not so much affected by anything like redshift or lensing. But because we are in a, well, cosmological space time, so we were able to use some approximation theory, so uh, high um, frequency ap approximation that allows us to make use of the parameter of the scaling of the, of the parameters in our problem. So we have a cosmological zone where we are so far away from the source that everything else is basically um, small compared to this distance to the source. And um, so we were able to use a mathematical technique that people also use in nonlinear optics to give us, we don't need to see that null infinity or the equivalent that we don't know what it is really, but we can actually uh, make use of the scaling properties and extract the information anyway. Okay, I have maybe one minute. So the thing that we found is that in a cosmological um, space time where we have inhomogeneities that come into the game, so when we are in a cosmological zone, the memory as well as the gravitational waves, but this memory is what I'm interested in here is, will be um, changed by a factor which is of course the redshift and a factor here I call it zeta 2 and this includes um, uh, information about weak gravitational lensing. So the inhomogeneity is coming to the game because lensing affects um, this um, memory as well. And so maybe the two things to take away here is that we do have some interesting um, two types of memories, but the ordinary memory of a fast particle can mimic the null memory. So that's interesting also in terms of maybe measurements. 
And for the cosmological, cosmological setting, so I mentioned the result before by a group uh, of uh, LIGO people that by stacking events like binary black hole mergers, you should be able to measure or see the memory at some point. So here with Cosmo, so maybe with other detectors in the future or LISA that will go to space, it might be easier to see memory because it will be enlarged by redshift and, uh, and also by lensing so that one would only need one uh, event to see that, for instance. Okay, so I close here. Thank you very much. I'm just curious as an experimenter, how do I separate, this is the electromagnetic case. Okay. How do I separate just the plane momentum in the electromagnetic wave from the kick you're talking about? So, okay. The Are they the same thing? I don't believe so, but so? It's a, I don't think it makes it easy to do this experiment. Okay. Might not be easy, no. <laughs> you're the experimentalist. No, no, I, I'm trying to figure <laughs> out how you separate those two effects. I mean, here's this wave that's come along. It has momentum of its own. It's mm -hmm. going to kick the detector, no way out. Right, there's exactly And so that's now one. that's a kick. Yes. That's proportional to the, um, the amount of energy in the, in the wave. Right. Now you have a thing which is also proportional to the intensity at times of time, which is the energy again. So I don't know how you separate those two things. So um, there's one thing, so if you have a velocity, right, so one thing should not be, sur we should not be surprised by that. Um, so if you have charge test particles, right, and that send electromagnetic waves, of course I have some residual velocities, but now I'm talking about a velocity in a direction where I don't expect it, so that's one thing. But I agree, so there's many problems with um, electromagnetic noise, I mean, that, that also add to all that, so I don't know how difficult it, it or not it could be to do that. You mentioned that LIGO might potentially detect this memory effect by stacking whatever. Well, the expert whatever. sits next to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, yeah, That's a different the, the expert yeah, yeah. can tell me. But the thing is, you're talking about a permanent displacement. Yeah. And I can imagine something like Lisa doing a permanent displacement. But LIGO, I thought, you know, these masses all want to come back to their initial position. They're not going to remember any permanent displacement. So I, I'm missing something in my head. How, how exactly this measurement would be made? No, the thing is, um, the way it should look like, right, so you have basically um, the way I, you can think about it, so you have a wave that comes in and so all the experts in the audience, you have these nice plots and then, well, things go back. So in principle, you should be able to see a shift there. And um, so it's like, uh, I don't have a blackboard, but it's like a step function almost. Um, so this is a cumulative effect that um, builds up on top of when the wave packet is traveling through, so it's cumulative and it will stay there. And as a, you can think of this, I mean, one Minkowski space be, before the, the wave comes, the wave travels through, something happens, and I'm in a different Minkowski space after that. Maybe, maybe a better answer to the question is that, is that there, there are frequency components in that transition which are in the detector band. Mm -hmm. It's not all at DC. Ramesh, there, there is another way to think of this, uh, which is uh, if you consider the Schwarzschild metric around an object, okay, even at large distances there is a small correction, which is a further, you know, GM over R, the distance. And because the mass of the object changes as a result of having less energy within the sphere associated with the distance, so there, there is less mass, so there is a permanent change to the metric, right, and, and that changes distances. But, but in that case, uh, there are many sources that lose energy. Yes. And, like, and that's why neutrinos also have the same effects. Right. Basically, you are changing the metric permanently because of loss of energy. Exactly. And we have, you know, a lot of many more supernovae taking place in the universe than, right. than gravitation wave right. sources. And and the so so these are losing neutrinos. And on average, the universe maintains roughly the same mean density. Yes. And so the issue is really a foreground because you have all these other changes in right. the metric that compensate each other. Right. And potentially they cancel out. Yeah. Right. So one has so, to do a, a more careful calculation as right, to so. what is the foreground of these permanent changes. Absolutely, right. So of course there's also some stochastic background which is even, which, which should be maybe detectable by nanograph, I think, or they, they hope to do that. And um, so, yeah, one needs to really go into the details and distinguish the foreground from these other effects, that's right. Okay, so more questions will be left for dinner. Or, okay, maybe one more. Is it possible to permanently disrupt a, a bound system 
with some finite escape velocity with the gravitational kick effect, memory effect. Uh, what do you exactly mean? I so mean suppose you have, for, for instance, a binary system on very eccentric orbits, so a weakly bound system, or some two particles bound some by some uh, process. If you know the gravitational waves pass through the system and make a permanent change in the in, uh, in that system in that system could you permanently disrupt this system so it wouldn't oh. be bound anymore I, I, I don't think so I mean it's first of all it's, it would be very complicated to do that and, and so it's a very tiny effect also so probably okay so we have to close this session now um, because we have to leave the room uh, so that it can be transformed into a banquet.